are your host for this evening, TV's Ian Lee. Welcome to the 11 o'clock show. I'm Kurdish rebel leader Ian Lee and I'm being held against my will. Holding me for trial on tonight's show is Turkey's Deirdre O'Kane. Hello, Ian is guilty and he will pay. And campaigning for my release is scary fundamentalist Mackenzie Crook. Hello, I'm Mackenzie Crook and if Ian's not released, I'll burn myself. I will. <laughs> In the next half hour, we'll genetically modify all the big news stories to suit our needs, including... What we should really think about Frankenstein Foods. The truth behind Far Eastern gambling syndicates. And fresh from community service, it's the return of the 11 o'clock show youth reporter Ali G. But don't worry if you haven't seen the news or you're too stupid to understand it. Radio Caroline DJ Tommy Vance is on hand with all the top stories in his news slam. It's Tuesday and the Kurds have gone crazy! They want their chief released. They're rioting in London, Athens, Paris, Frankfurt, Oslo. Christ, how many Kurds are there? <laughs> and why don't they sod off back to Kurdland? <laughs> this guy's so cross, he's caught fire. From Kurdish screams to mutant genes, and the modified madness deepens. What the hell is this? <laughs> no, it's just a satirical statement meant to scare. Ignore it. Lord Sainsbury's in the doghouse. He's the science minister. They've just discovered he's got links with the food industry. What? Lord Sainsbury? <laughs> no, 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 no sense. From processed peas to the peas process. And Kenneth <laughs> rising by lunch talks with Tommy Blair. The IRA won't hand in their guns and ammo. I don't blame them. I've never handed in mine. You should see my garage. I keep it under lock and key. I'd hate for the kids to find my magazines. From something very specific to the vast South Pacific. And female yachtsman Isabelle Autissier is plucked from the hands of the cruel sea by an Italian. Typical high time. He's in the middle of the bloody ocean and he can still find a woman. You've got to admire that. Don't trust him, Isabelle. Just remember, the Italian for no is no! Well, someone please tell me what's going on. First, we got this silly fuss over BSE. Now the press are worried over scientists crossing vegetables with human genes. Where will it all end, they ask? Will we end up eating potatoes with real eyes? Is this, as the Express claims, a move towards cannibalism? No. <laughs> this is cannibalism. David Harker here, your classic cannibal, hacked off the head and limbs of a young mum before eating chunks of her leg with pasta and grated cheese. <laughs> if she'd offered him a simple bowl of genetically modified soup, who knows, she might only have had her head cut off. <laughs> he would not have eaten her leg. And if cannibal serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer could have begun his day with a bowl of GM prunes, those poor, poor gays would never have been eaten. Even today, they would be sitting there, untouched, in his fridge. <laughs> GM food saves lives. It's also the future of British exports. Currently, Britain is only supplying the rest of the world with hostages and people to be killed in avalanches. <laughs> but with genetic engineering, we can put all that's best about Britain into a plum, for example. <laughs> now, we have the technology to put the nation's favourite Trevor McDonald into a cucumber. <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> And back home in People's Britain, at last we've got the freedom to choose genetically modified produce. GM food now has to be clearly labelled, so whenever you see signs like these... <laughs> ..you know you're safe. With GM food, exports are up, cannibalism is down, and we can put an end to famine. Hurrah! To the politicians who've today got the knives out for Science Minister Lord Sainsbury over supposed links with a leading supermarket, we say no. Use those knives to prepare a healthy GM meal. Genetically modified food is 100% safe. Tony Blair eats it, Linda McCartney eats it. She's even putting it in her vegetable sausages and she's never looked better. <laughs> Psychopaths, paedophiles, nutters and dirty sods, we love them dearly. But every so often they spoil it for everyone by killing our kids. Well, fear no more. <laughs> Jack Straw has the answer. Lock them all up before they commit a crime. But how can we spot a psychopath? Ian went onto the streets of Psycho Britain to find out. So Jack Straw says we should lock psychos up. 
But how can we tell if people are really mental or just a little bit wacky? I've come here to London to find out. Supposing I started speaking in tongues right now, would I be mental? No. If I started swearing a lot right now, would I be mental? Um, possibly. Depends. If I got my winky out, would I be me mental? <laughs> Depends. If I bent over and, and smelt your hat and went, mmm, that's a lovely smell, would I be mental? I think it was crazy, mental. Yeah. <laughs> your hair's lovely. It smells wonderful and it feels like angel's wings. <laughs> Did you feel uncomfortable there? No, I didn't, because it's all... because... Uh, you, don't, you're not, you don't mean what you're saying. It is very nice. Right? <laughs> I'm supposing I, I just shielded myself like this, got my winky out and just waved it and said, look at the beast, look at the beast. <laughs> you know, you Definitely. This list was compiled in order of madness, one being the most mad, ten being the least. Uh, this has been done by people on the street today. Have a look at that list. Is there anything you want to change, shift around, anything you should think is more mad? Let's see what else we've got. Smashing your nan's face with a bat. Is that good at all? <laughs> What reason could there be for smashing your nan's face with a bat, do you think? I suppose she just killed your little brother or something like that. <laughs> Bumming? Reasonable. Yeah, I'll leave it there. I mean, do, is that something you enjoy? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Not anymore. OK. If I read the case study and you tell me if you think they're mental or not. This is a man in his mid-30s, desperately confused about his sexuality. He has a speech defect. Hangs around shopping centres, always harassing old women and young mothers in the name of what he considers to be entertainment. He has difficulty walking. Is he mental or not mental? Yeah, mental. <laughs> he thinks he can dance on the ceiling. And he pretended once to be blind just to attract the, the attention of innocent schoolgirls. Uh, probably mad. <laughs> Hard-working lorry driver with an eye for the ladies, tidy beard and a meticulous planner. Very good with his hands. Mental or not mental? Probably all right. <laughs> Work shy, violent, sleepy and racist. Not four of the seven dwarves, but how judges brand <laughs> humble British Bobby. Sadly, like many of their young suspects, the image of the boys in blue has taken quite a beating recently. But that's all about to change. <laughs> Baddies across Britain are quaking in their boots at the range and sophistication of some of the old Bill's new techniques. One of the force's cunning moves is to make criminals cardboard and therefore easier to catch. <laughs> <laughs> this life-size cutout of the notorious flat cap robber led directly to his arrest two days later by this man, the heroic <laughs> flat-packed copper. <laughs> A major part of the filth's work is obviously crime prevention. In the past, this has included fitting up the Irish, doctoring evidence and locking up psychos, just in case. But in new people's police, the pen is mightier than the staircase. Crime <laughs> prevention now takes the form of sending greeting cards to known slags. The idea is that the police show villains they know where they live, they know what they're up to, and they know when their birthday is. Mackenzie's kept all the cards the police sent to him. As you can see, I've got a wonderful collection, but... This has got to be my favourite. <laughs> Dear Mackenzie, your 18th birthday comes only once. To see 19, move house, you nonce. <laughs> Formidable. But greeting cards are not the only innovation. The cops have also put race relations at the top of their agenda. They want to attract more ethnic recruits, or, in police parlance, darkies. <laughs> To make new recruits feel at home, future uniforms will reflect this newfound multiculturalism. And here he is. He may look like a crack-addled member of the underclass, but, <laughs> but behind it all, he's a highly trained crime-fighting machine who fears nothing. <laughs> Except, perhaps, craft scissors. Right, Mackenzie? That's right, Ian. Harmless plastic scissors like these, with their rounded, spoon-sharp blades, can actually foil these high-tech coppers. Mm, let's see. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> don't have nightmares, good people of Britain. Not every criminal mastermind is as clever as me. But, just in case, we're launching a campaign to get these vicious cop killers banned. And if it leads to just one less cardboard cop murder, it will have all been worthwhile. <laughs> Thank you, Mackenzie. Now, most people think of MPs as the kind of people who'd knowingly feed their kids infected meat or mutated soya beans. <laughs> but that doesn't mean they don't have feelings. We sent Angel of Delight Sophie Stapleton down to Westminster to find the softer side of our honourable members. What's the story? Genetic food. Is it a dog that will eat itself? 
Well, I hope not, but we're saying to the government, be careful. Do you think as a politician you follow through? <laughs> I certainly do. I have a little doggy three. But do you never feel like it's sort of, um, you know, you're in an out-of-control car and then you suddenly think, God, here I am and I've left terrible skid marks behind and I just don't know what, you know. Well, I mean, if you admit you made a mistake, people forgive and forget. I suppose sometimes you must feel quite retiring. Is what we see the tortoise head emerging? <laughs> You have to be careful of your personality in public life. Government ministers can declare war. They can send troops into battle. That is an awesome responsibility. God. Is there a reason why the uh, pain is in the word campaign? Uh, I like it, but it's not spelt the same way. <laughs> not really good at my spelling. <laughs> if this is the carrot, what's the donkey? <laughs> Building a row of bricks mm -hmm. and as you go through life you carry on placing more bricks on that road so there are organizations how many bricks um, I, the, the number I have in my mind is ten I mean, <laughs> who shoot the sheriff um, oh, shoot the sheriff. Mm. Yes, that's well. Who shoots the sheriff? Well, who does? <laughs> when the ant dances, the bowl almost laughs, doesn't it? It's like, you know, if you're... Your, your metaphors are wonderful. Oh, and, thank uh, you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really think in those terms, but um, I, I appreciate your metaphors. Coming up in part two, the first results from tonight's Brit Awards. How to fake your own Channel 4 documentary and Ali G hobnobs with posh boy Jacob Rees-Mogg to learn all about class. Don't leave, you're the only friends I've got. <laughs>Show. Over the break, I've been eating a genetically modified apple and it tasted like shit. <laughs> I say politicians don't use those knives to prepare this Frankenstein food. Stick them in the back of Lord Sainsbury, evil mastermind behind this freaky scourge of genetically modified food. The most dangerous threat to this nation since the Germans and Glenn Hoddle. Sainsbury <laughs> must go. My dog's got no nose. How does he smell, you may ask? Well, frankly, he doesn't smell very nice. <laughs> now, you're probably thinking that TV's Ian Lee has lost his immaculate comedy timing, but you'd be wrong. I can assure you that I am still a very funny man there. What I did there was deliberately throw the punchline on that joke because huge and dirty amounts of black market cash were riding on me fluffing the gag. That's right. I took a dive for the Far East betting syndicate. <sighs> Loads of cash. <laughs> now, I shouldn't really be telling you this, but Jack Doherty has amassed a vast personal fortune from this very same gambit. So we already know the syndicate rig our football and our late night comedy shows, but what else have they got their filthy Malaysian mitts on? We asked Mackenzie, our resident conspiracy theorist, to go out and find out which truth is out there. Thanks, Deirdre. Well, I've done rather well. I've found out through my contacts that the Far East betting syndicate has also rigged everything else, literally. <laughs> World War II. Rigged. 20,000 to 1 on the Allies. Tasty odds. <laughs> Lady Die. Rigged. Dead at 36 in a tunnel with an Arab. 20 to 1. Worth a punt. <laughs> Vanessa, Trisha, Kilroy. Rigged. All rigged. They faked it. Then bet it was faked. 7 to 2 on. Not an attractive... <laughs> Not an attractive bet to you and me, but to those gambling, crazy Chinese, irresistible. <laughs> they bet on anything. They bet on how many bets a betting man would bet in a betting shop in order to bet whether the bet he bets, they bet you better, you better, you bet. <laughs> they love it. Thanks, Mackenzie. <laughs> so it seems you just can't make an honest bet these days without crafty oriental businessmen nobbling the odds. Well. As a service to our viewers, we've set up the 11 o'clock show betting service syndicate. You can now place your stake in safety on the kind of bets we all want to see. Such as, number one, Sophie Rhys Jones getting pregnant before her marriage to Prince Edward. That's 100 to 1. <laughs> the 11 o'clock show being pulled before the end of the first series. That's 5 to 1. <laughs> that's 50 to 1. <laughs> Millennium Bug accidentally triggering World War III. That's 5,000 to 1. Three zeros there. And Jack Cunningham to feed GM food to a family member on live TV before the end of April, 25 to 1. 
Now, I must stress that all these odds are for real. I've had a monkey on Sophie, Mackenzie's put 50 pence on the Millennium Bug, and Deirdre's back cutting them with a tenner. And you can place your money over the phone by calling this number. We'll be checking up on all these genuine bets and adding some others over the coming weeks. Now, TV bosses have been blushing over the last few days at revelations that their programmes are prey to hoaxers. To show how easy it is to dupe your average media whore, we went onto the streets of Britain to let our viewers make their own Frankenstein documentary. The basic situation is, I've got to do this report um, for Channel 4. We've got to get this done in about, oh, bloody hell, shit, we've got to get it done in about an hour. I can't be chasing about the country no, no. finding, you know, real no. people. <laughs> Basically, you're just going to have to make out that that person was you when I give you the details. Right, basically, if we can stick this on, on your lip there. Yeah? Yeah, stick it down. <laughs> I, I just can't, you know, I can't accept that any laughter, otherwise we're really buggered. And I was talking about titty titty bang bang. Knob gannet. Knob gannet. Nipple butcher. Nipple butcher and cock... Cock hoover. Cock hoover. Do I just move your right hand, left hand a bit? With an ever-increasing number of sexual harassment cases coming before British courts, I've been speaking to the capital's victims of harassment to find out what society still has to learn from their experiences. <laughs> Some office workers like Ruth are having to employ the latest technology to avoid harassment in the workplace. What have you got here? I've got a bra. And I actually did it sort of uh, so it's wired up to this klaxon, so that if they did touch my breast in any way, or whatever you want to call it, I blew the horn. Shall I make yeah. up? I'm a, I'm a sexual harasser. You can, you can, Do you want yeah. to hold on to that tight? Yeah. Hey! How you doing there, Knob Gannett? <laughs> but harassment is not gender-specific. In a desperate bid to stop the continuous sexual advancements of his female colleagues, Brian here reinvented himself as a homosexual. No. So what names did they used to call you? Legs, magnet, <laughs> cannon, and, cannon and balls, Willy Wonka, <laughs> Billy Bonka, Bonka <laughs> so Finally, I met supermarket worker Greg. His horrific brush with harassment left him scarred for life when his colleagues decided to tattoo a message to his forehead. And um, what exactly did they write? Gay <laughs> Lord. Not content with inflicting physical scars, his colleagues also brainwashed Greg and conditioned him to strip every time they uttered a key word. Hyenas. <laughs> it's amazing to think that in the sexually equal 90s, this sort of thing still goes on. This man was used and abused in the workplace. This is Paul Garner in central London. Just time to give the answers to our Kurdish quiz, which we set yesterday. Number one, the answer was the Greek embassy. Number two, it was Geoffrey Archer who sent the blankets. Three, it was Kurd A, was the Kurd that was on fire. Four, probably Allah. And question five, this caught a lot of people out. The answer was, of course, off of plates, like the rest of us. Tonight's winner has not yet been confirmed, but it's probably Robbie Williams, who seems to have won everything else this evening. Congratulations, Robbie. You've scooped a free smear test at a hospital of your choice. <laughs> like most things in People's Britain, the class divide has mutated. To find out where we all stand in today's pecking order, we sent Ali G to talk to head boy Jacob Rees-Mogg. Yeah, you don't stop. It goes out to the cool up top. Wicked. I is here with Lord Rees Mogg and we is talking about class. Lord Mogg is going to tell us how we all can be upper class, don't we? <laughs> it was very kind of you to promote me to the uh, nobility, but of course I'm, I'm not. My, my father is, is Lord Rees Mogg and I'm just a commoner like everybody else. So what is class? What is class? Class is how other people uh, perceive individuals to be. Which class is Packies in? <laughs> Packies. By which? Which class? Is they in middle class, upper class? I think, I think it's what you're saying Pakistanis living I... in, in, in England. Um, they're not in a class um, by nature of where they've come from. What do you think makes a girl upper class? Well, exactly the same thing that makes a man upper class. 
But is it things it's... like she spits into a hanky? <laughs> I don't think spitting into one's handkerchief is widely regarded as a symbol of membership of the upper class. What if someone is so rich they have a swimming pool? Would they then be upper class? Um, no, no, I think this is a bizarre definition of, right. of, of class. What if they had a swimming pool made of gold but filled with champagne and not the cheap stuff? <laughs> then would they be in the upper class? What if, like Cleopatra, they bathed in ass's milk? Um, in what? Ass's milk. Um, ass milk? Butty milk? Uh, ass's. From your... No, no, no. <laughs> donkeys. All oh, right. <laughs> so what if... You got busy with my sister. <laughs> you didn't advise it because she have, ain't the cleanest girl out I there. I have a sister. I, well, it can be arranged. She'll be keen. I, I, I've been speculating on, on my ha ha having a relationship with somebody I've never met and that I leading to a child being born and then as to what class it might be <laughs> is so uh, far fetched. Um, as, as to be ridiculous. I have no idea. Uh, what, you about think this. you was too good for my sister? I certainly not. No, I was uh, I was like, you uh, is. No, no, I'm, no you is, though. Uh, she's I'm, I'm rank. Probably, she's nothing. I'm probably not worthy of your sister. No, um, believe me. Um, even my mum can tell her she's a slug. Would I be upper class if I got a top hat and wore it? Um, well, would you like to try? I have a top hat. I can lend it to you for the next few minutes of this interview, if you'd like. So I'm out of class now. Absolutely. You're a dead ringer for Lord Smoothie. Thank you, Jacob rees -Mogg. You have shown that class is interesting, and we should know about it, but not get stuck in it, if we is going to get ahead. Wicked. Thank you very much. Keep it real, Jacob. Thank you. Diana. And come and visit us at the yeah. Stains Massive. It's a pleasure. <laughs>In the light of today's events at the Greek Embassy, we would like to show you an excerpt from a special, genuine BBC fire safety video featuring Anthea Turner. And this is particularly for all our Kurdish viewers. Unfortunately, due to pressure on time, we've been forced to combine it with the results of tonight's Brit Awards. We'll understand if you want to keep the winners a secret, so if you don't want a lesson in safety with a genuine BBC video or to know the results, please look away now. And if you want something to happen to you on a... I'm sure you'll agree that was very informative. <laughs> and there's just time to take a look at tomorrow's headlines. Mo Fapers call for the demise of Lord Sainsbury after today's revelations that he owns shares in a biotechnological company. Uh, the Sun reckons he'll be pushed. Crop shock shop dropped. Uh, the Mirror predicts Soyanara. Sainsbury checks out. The Star leads with uh, I'll be off then. And The Guardian leads with Sainsbury's money off for teachers. <laughs> Thank you. That's all we have time for. In tomorrow's show, Rich Hall joins us live from Las Vegas and Ali G gets the lowdown on Out of Town in his guide to the countryside. But for now, I've been Ian Lee. And I'm Mackenzie Crook. And I've been Deirdre O'Kane. Goodbye. <laughs>